Hello, hello. So in this video, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through the engine start procedure and also the aircraft configuration. So that's getting the aircraft configured, ready for takeoff and ready for flying. So at the end of the last episode, we talked about uh, cockpit preparation and we also went through the before starts checklist. So there was one step that I missed out on that previous video and that was uh, turning on the beacon light before we start the engines. So I'm going to do that just now. So to turn on the beacon light, all we do is have a look up on the overhead panel up here and the beacon light will be this switch here. So just flick that on and you'll see that the red beacon light starts flashing on the aircraft. So now we're ready for engine start. So before I start the engines, I want to talk briefly about the engine, engine numbering system. So engines are typically numbered from left to right. Um, as you sit on the plane and face forward. So on a two engine plane, for example, the left side engine will be engine number one, and then the right side engine will be number two. Now, in the event that an aircraft has more than one engine, like a Boeing 747, for example, which has four engines, then the outer left engine would be engine number one, and then the inner left engine would be number two, the right inside engine would be number three, and then the right outside engine would be number four. So back in the Airbus, there's actually two different ways that we can start the engines. We can start the engines uh, or do what's called a static start where we stay in the same position and start the engines or we can do a pushback start where the aircraft is being pushed backwards and we can start the engines that way. For simplicity, I'm going to do a static start in the simulator but I'm also going to talk about the steps that you would use for a pushback start. So if you're going to do a pushback start, the first step would be to turn off the parking brake. And then once that's turned off, you would then initiate the pushback. So you can do that either by pressing shift plus P for pushback. Um, or if you're using a ground crew add-on, they usually include an automated pushback feature. So you could then initiate that to start the aircraft rolling backwards. If you're doing a static start, so you're doing a start without a pushback, all you would do is simply leave the parking brake on because that obviously when you start the engines it makes sure that the aircraft doesn't roll away. So whether you're pushing back or whether you're doing a static start the next couple of steps are the same. So you'll notice I've changed my view here so what I've got here dominating the view are the two ECAM displays and you'll notice that these will change during the startup procedure. And then at the bottom, I've got a view of the pedestal, but more importantly, I've got a view of the engine master panel here. So if you have a look just now on the upper ECAM, you'll notice that the engine displays are all kind of red and they're X'd out. That will change in a second. So the first step is to change the engine mode selector. So this knob here, we switch that onto ignition or, or ignition and start. So flick that over just now. <clears throat> and you'll notice that the ECAM pages change. It, so we changed the upper ECAM, the, all of the engine displays are now live, so to speak. So they're ready to display engine information. And you'll notice that the lower ECAM display automatically switched over to the engine page. Now it's time to start the engines. So in the Airbus, it is very, very simple. All we simply do is move the master switches from the off position to the on position. Now we don't need to worry about introducing fuel. We don't need to worry about uh, turning on or off packs or anything like that. All we do is just flick the switch and the onboard computers will handle everything for us. So in jet aircraft, the typical engine start sequence is actually engine two first and then engine one. Now this changes depending on the type of the aircraft, the airline, um, the configuration of the hardware inside the plane, you know, depending on how the electrical systems work and the pneumatic systems and all that. But for simplicity's sake, we're going to do engine two first and then engine one. So to start the engine, all you simply do, as I said, is just flick the switch. And the engine will now automatically begin to start. So your responsibility as a pilot is just to keep an eye on the engine displays here, just to make sure that nothing um, you know, abnormal occurs. So you're just keeping an eye there, make sure that the engine speeds begin normally which you can see there, and you can see that the ignition has started by this indication here. So you just let the engine ramp up to its idle speed, 
of course we checked earlier on that the throttles were in idle so you just let the engine start up and stabilize at its idle speed the uh, the documentation which comes with the Aerosoft Airbus gives you uh, you know, a few nominal numbers so for example N1 is about 19.5 uh, exhaust gas, gas temperature is about 380 so you'll see those nominal numbers and what to expect in the documentation there. Now once the engine has started and is stable at idle then we can move on to the second engine or engine number one in this case so we simply flick the switch there and again we just keep an eye on all of the engine readouts just to make sure that nothing abnormal occurs. Now as you start the engine sequence you'll also hear the uh, power transfer unit, that kind of classic Airbus barking dog sound will start to occur as well. <clears throat> and you'll know if anything abnormal happens because normally the numbers will light up in um, yellow or red if something is out of limit there. So you just let engine 1 come up to speed and just let it stabilize there. Now it's worth noting, <coughs> pardon me, it's worth noting that there are two different types of engine which come with the Aerosoft Airbus. You have CFM engines and IAE engines. Now the IAE engines actually take a bit longer to start up than the CFM. That is not a problem with the engines, it's not a problem with the simulator, that is by design. The real world IAE engines have a, a, a function where they sort of spin up to speed for about 30 seconds before they actually ignite and start the fuel flow so just be aware of that the IAE engines might take a bit longer to start up than the CFM ones now if you were doing a pushback start you need to be aware of your position and you need to make sure that the pushback finishes on the taxiway so that you're ready to taxi once the pushback is finished and you've come to a stop you would need to enable the parking brake again just to make sure that the aircraft doesn't roll away as the engines are starting. Typically this happens uh, after you've started one engine so you start the pushback and then you start one engine and then the pushback normally ends just as the first engine is coming up to its idle speeds and then you would then need to enable the parking brake and then start the second engine. Okay, so now that the engines have started, we need to do our off-to-start procedure. So the first thing to do is come down to the uh, engine mode selector and then return that back to its normal position. Next, we can turn off the APU bleed air and then turn off the APU master switch. So this will just turn off the APU because we no longer need it. All of the electrical power that we need is now being generated by the engines and all of the bleed air, the pressurized air, is also being generated by the main engines now as well. Next we can arm the spoilers, so just right click once on the spoilers there and you'll see it shifts up into the armed position. After that check the rudder trim and make sure that is at zero. Next we need to check the pitch trim. So you can find the pitch trim from the FMS here, so if we zoom in and go on to the performance page. Now you'll have a look here, this is where we entered the flaps and you'll notice that right next to that we have THS and that says up 0.8 so that is the trim setting that we need for takeoff. So how do we set that? Well the first thing we can do is we can come over to the ECAM page and click on the F control button here so that is flight controls and you'll see that it gives us a flight controls page on the lower ECAM and you'll notice in the middle it says pitch trim 0.0, .0 up. So the easiest way to set this is just to take your mass, put it over the trim wheels here and then roll the mass wheel backwards to set the trim. And if we zoom in again there you can see that it now says 0 0.8 up on the lower ecam there so that's how you set your trim for takeoff. After you've set the pitch trim what you need to do is you then need to do a flight control check. Now while you're sat in the cockpit it's really difficult to kind of look backwards and look back at the wings to make sure that when you move the controller the wings are actually doing the right thing. So pilots check their flight control responses through a electronic display like this. 
So on this page, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my joystick backwards and make sure that the flight controls do what's expected. So I'm going to move my joystick backwards now. And you can see that we get the elevators moving up, which is expected. Return it to center and then move them forward. Move my joystick forward, the elevators go down. So that is all expected. That's all working fine. Next, I'm going to test the alien runs. So I'm going to pull to the left. And the aliens move to the left. And we also get the spoilers uh, extend on the left side as well. Because the spoilers can assist with the roll control there. So return it to center. We move the alien runs to the right. That's all normal there. And then the last thing to check is the rudder. So we move the rudder to the left. That works. We move the rudder to the right. That works. And also you want to make sure that all of these controls move back to their center position when you release pressure on your joystick or your flight controls as well. After we check the flight controls, we need to set the flaps for takeoff. So we just move the flaps down into position 2. And then you can check the flaps indicator here to make sure that they move into the correct position. Next, if you require engine and wing anti-ice, you would then enable those systems now. For this flight, we don't need them, so we can consider that as being checked off. And then finally, we need to do a couple of checks on the lower ECAM here. So first, we need to check the ECAM status page. Just make sure there's no error messages or no warnings popping up, which there isn't. And then finally, we check the ECAM door page just to make sure that all of the doors are in fact closed and you can see there that we have all of our slides are now armed as well. And that is the off to start checklist. So now we move into our taxi phase of flight. So if you are using air traffic control, now would be the time to speak to ground control and request clearance to taxi. So air traffic control would just give you instructions, you know, taxi via this route and that route and they basically give you directions to follow on the ground. Once you've received those instructions, the first thing to do would be to turn on the taxi lights on the nose wheel. So just flick that to the taxi position there. And then we are ready to go. So we can turn off the parking brake. And what I'm going to do just to get the aircraft rolling is I'm going to increase the power to about 25% on the N1 indicator there. I mean 25 to 30 percent will get the aircraft rolling so you can see we're starting to move forwards so just gonna turn the aircraft I'll just adjust my view so you can see there so a little bit zoomed in at the moment but uh, hopefully get an idea there so once the aircraft is rolling you can actually bring the thrust back to about idle and the aircraft will happily you know put it along at a reasonable ground speed or a safe ground speed rather and not accelerate too much okay so once you've started taxiing it's usually good practice to just test the brakes so just dab the brakes very quickly just to make sure that there are, is pressure in the brakes and the brakes will actually respond uh, when you stamp on them basically okay so the next step is to set the auto brake system but first I want to talk about this little checklist here on the ECAM display so this is a like a kind of minor takeoff checklist here and you can see that we've got a lot of information in green but we also have a few bits of text in blue there so if you see any blue here that means that you as the pilot need to take action on those systems to prepare them for takeoff so you can see we have auto brake dot 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 max so we need to set the auto brakes to max so if we just go over to the auto brake system here click on max you can see that the blue disappears and that is now okay after checking the auto brake you just want to double check the flight control unit just to make sure that your speed is dashed out so dashed out your heading is dashed out and your altitude is set and you have the little ball or circle icon next to your speed heading and altitude as well. After you check the flight control unit, now you need to check the takeoff config. So there's actually a little button here 
next to the lower ecam, which says takeoff config. So this is basically just a, a sort of a self test or self check to make sure that the aircraft is configured and ready for takeoff. So you can check to make sure on the little um, ecam checklist here that you have no blue here. And you see the last step is takeoff config. So we just go down to this button here, press the button, and it says takeoff config normal. So if we have all green and we, it says normal there, that means that everything is fine and we are ready for takeoff basically. Next we need to turn on the weather radar. So if we come down to the weather radar panel here, right next to the captain's seat, the first thing to do is to turn the uh, mode knob onto the weather plus turbulence. So just move it one uh, click to the right there. And then just left click on this toggle switch here, move it to the number one position, and that turns on the weather radar. Now, depending on what the weather is in the simulator, you may see some weather start to pop up on the nav display, or you may not. Um, we're flying in fairly good weather, so we're not going to see anything here. Um, if you do have bad weather and you still don't see anything, just double check your nav display brightness here, and it's the larger of the two knobs here that you want to check. Just make sure that the um, the weather radar sort of knob is set to high uh, to make sure that any weather that does pop up on the weather radar will be visible. After that you just want to double check the flight director switch to make sure that it's on. And then finally you want to check your transponder. So I'm just going to use a random transponder code of 2356 because those are the easiest buttons to click on there. Um, so you just want to make sure that you have the transponder code set to what air traffic control gave you if you are flying under IFR conditions. Now the transponder doesn't need to be active yet but the transponder code does need to be set in. Now it's worth noting that when you're setting in a transponder code you need to type in four numbers for it to save. So for example if I just typed in one two three it will take a few seconds and then it will revert back to the previous number. So if I wanted 1, 2, 3, 4, I have to type in 1, 2, 3, and then 4. So I have to type in all four numbers for it to save the number there. And that is about everything that I'm going to cover in this video. So in the next video, we're going to talk about before takeoff, takeoff, and the climb out. So it's going to be quite a, uh, a busy episode to next episode. So I'm um, looking forward to doing that. Um, so before I wrap up this one, first of all I just want to say a massive massive thank you to the handful of people who are supporting me on Patreon currently. Um, your support honestly means the world to me, it's not something I take for granted so thank you all sincerely, um, it does mean a lot to me. So uh, that's about it for this video, so thank you all very much for watching, take care out there and I will catch you all later.